Okay. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first ever Careers in Sustainability Q&A session like this here in Greater Manchester. And a big welcome to everybody who has joined us here today. We have five amazing panel members who are all in jobs helping us to address our climate emergency here in Greater Manchester. Before we meet them, though, I'm going to introduce myself and tell you a little bit about today's session. My name is Niall Henry. I'm the founder and CEO of the Blair Project. We use the excitement and exhilaration of electric motorsport to infuse young people to pursue rewarding careers in the digital, tech and engineering sectors. Through our innovative STEM programmes like Proto-EV, we get teams of young people to convert used petrol go carts into fully electric e-carts, which they get to test and race to see which is the fastest and the most energy efficient. Proto-EV also taps into the climate change activism of young people by providing them with hands-on experience of working with green technologies. So I'm going to tell you a bit more about today's session. It's going to be split into two parts. So in the first part of the session, I'm going to lead with some questions for our panelists, which should roughly take around about 15 minutes. And while I'm asking these questions, I want you guys to submit your own questions in the comment box down below. And I'm going to choose some of your questions to ask our panelists. But also, guys, make sure you leave your name and where you're from, because I'm going to give you a shout out. And with our panelists today, with our amazing panelists today, we have people who manage our waste, look at innovative ways to help give us and save us energy and look after our natural environment. So let's go and meet our panelists. We've got Hannah from HS2, Julian from NG, Sarah from Swayze, Richard from the University of Salford and Amelia from the University of Manchester. So guys, our panelists, can you tell our viewers at home a little bit more about your about you, your job role, where you work and what you do in your day to day job roles? And um, we'll start with Sarah. Hi, Niall. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, so, yes, uh, my name's Sarah. I am the sustainability lead for Suez. So Suez works across the UK to put waste to good use. So in Manchester, we look after the uh, household waste recycling centres, or you probably know them better as the tip or the dump. Uh, and we take the waste that you can't recycle and put it to good use by generating electricity from it. So uh, over the past 12 months, we've generated enough electricity in Man Manchester to boil three billion kettles which is a lot of cups of tea, um, I must say. Uh, so my job is to reduce the environmental impact of what we do and the waste that we handle by recycling more and reducing the amount that's produced and also to improve the and do more in the communities that we work in. And we're, we're doing lots of things in Manchester at the moment. And for me, no day is different. So it's everything from working with our senior managers to put a plan in place as to what we're going to do and how we're going to do it, working with our, our teams across the country to understand what they're going to do uh, locally and the customers that we work with to, to put these plans in into action uh, and also to monitor what we do to understand where we are now and what improvements we, ne we make which involves working with a lot of data which is more interesting than it probably sounds I, I promise uh, and I also do a lot of promotion about making sure that people see that all the good things that we do because we do a lot of great stuff uh, around around the country and that's probably my job in a nutshell. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Sarah. And next, we're going to move on to Julian. Hi, good afternoon. I'm the partnership director for the Northwest region for a business called NG, and we employ about 170,000 people across the world, helping our customers and partners um, make the transition to zero carbon. Uh, my, my bureau particularly is working with our public sector partners, um, so Manchester Council is one of those and I spend a lot of my time working with the council, helping them achieve their ambitions and objectives around zero carbon. Um, I manage a team of around 50 people um, who actually maintain and keep all of Manchester's public estate, all its buildings uh, safe, uh, operational and in good working order. Uh, there's about 450 of those. And then we work with the council and other public sector partners to help them uh, think about how they can transition, transition to a low carbon economy and how they can actually achieve their carbon reduction ambitions. That's me in a nutshell. Thanks, Julian. And we'll have Richard. 
Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Richard. I, I work at the University of Salford, which is near the, the city centre of Manchester. Uh, I work in a uh, test facility. So I'm a scientist that basically studies how buildings perform. So we look at how we can save energy in buildings. So there it is on the screen. So in essence, what we have is we have a Victorian style uh, terrace, which many people live in, in, in the northwest in Manchester. And that sat in within a large fridge. That's really what we do. So we can take the temperature in down there, in there, sorry, down to minus 12, up to plus 30, and we can make wind, rain, snow, and we can also put sun on the building. So what we do is we make a change to the building, maybe change the windows or put some insulation in the loft. And then we go through a whole series of different conditions. So warm weather, cold weather, rainy weather, snowy weather, uh, and we see what effect uh, that intervention we call it uh change it makes to the change in energy performance of the building so really we're there to show people how to save energy in buildings but do it in a very scientific way and that's really what we do brilliant and amelia hi um so i'm amelia i work as a phd researcher at the university of manchester and the project that i specifically work on is um, has to do with producing sustainable and hopefully carbon neutral fuels uh, that could replace petrol which is polluting um, so for example we've tried to convert brewery waste and other types of industrial waste to propane specifically which can be used in cars or cooking. There's also some other applications of it. Um, so I work in a lab of about 40 people at the university. And my PhD also involves working with a startup called C3 Biotechnologies that aim to kind of make this process more economically feasible. Um, so yeah, that's what I do. Thank you. And lastly, we've got Hannah. Hi everybody, um, so my name's Hannah Leggett um, and I work on the Massive HS2 project, which some of you may have heard of. Um, so my role is the environmental manager and environmental lead for the Birmingham Curzon Street station, which is going to be the new HS2 station that will be built in the heart of Birmingham city centre. So in my role, I'm responsible for ensuring that any environmental impacts of the project are minimised and mitigated, which basically means looking after the environment and making sure it's not damaged or impacted while the railway and the, st the stations get built. Um, I also ensure that environment and sustainability are incorporated as part of the design process and also during construction and afterwards. Um, I also work with engineers and designers to ensure that all environmental impacts and aspects are covered as part of their works. My day to day can be very varied. I can go looking for the design for the new station and checking and making sure that it includes all the environment um, requirements to reading and signing off various environmental reports, taking government visitors out on site so they can see the progress of what we're doing and um, checking the works that our contractors are doing, working with engineers and designers, um, as mentioned before, to ensure that they're not doing anything that could harm the environment. Um, and mentoring young people and taking part in events such as this amazing one to help promote STEM and encourage young people into STEM careers. So that's pretty much my role in a nutshell. Thank you very much guys for your introductions and now we're going to go into the next part where we're going to I'm going to ask you guys some questions for our audience and the first question is going to be for Julian oh sorry yeah Julian and Hannah where will there be jobs related to solving our climate emergency in the next five years in your industry? Great question. It, it's fair to say that uh, the climate emergency impacts everybody, uh, every business, every person in their, every walk of life. And therefore, you know, there's a, there's a role for everyone to play within this. But particularly in our industry, what we're seeing is that um, there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a big drive for STEM based um, technology based jobs. Um, particularly around renewables, things like wind turbines, um, engineers, technicians, environmental engineers, that side of things, bringing in new renewable technologies as uh, more fossil based fuels uh, move out of that. And that leads into things like green infrastructure as well, uh, mobility, hydrogen, biofuels and electric vehicles. 
but in the main what we see is a big gap actually between the the technicians the supervisors the people doing the maintenance on the buildings and actually what's needed and we see a trend over the next few years of that increasing and that skills gap still being there so a lot of the roles that uh, exist today are, are what we need more of but there are some there are some new roles which will emerge as well as as the uh, the climate agenda continues to take hold with the technology based emphasis OK, so um, in my industry and I'm going to focus on the HS2 project, um, there's going to be a wide variety of roles and I would say that um, there will be even more roles and opportunities than there are now as we move forward and, and grain not just greater knowledge, but also understanding the impacts of climate change and the essential need and requirements for, for companies and projects to be more sustainable in our activities. Um, there'll be roles such as what I do now, so um, environmental managers, which ensure that environmental impacts are minimised, um, as well as sustainability and carbon management specialist roles, which will look at how we can reduce our carbon footprint and also look at alternative energy sources and methods and help us to move further away from our reliance on coal, uh, fossil fuels such as coal. And um, there'll also be climate change managers and specialists who would look at how we can build things that will last longer periods of time and also be more adaptable and able to survive climate change events. Um, just there will be a really vast and wide varied range of roles available that focus on environment and sustainability, um, especially within HS2 as this is a key commitment that we have made as a project and in five years we'll be right in the thick of actually building the railway and the stations. So we're going to need people then more than ever. Brilliant, thank you to the both of you. And my next question is for Amelia. You're doing some interesting research right about now. Um, tell us a bit about it and how, how it might change the way we use and develop fuels for the future. Uh, yeah, so I primarily work in the lab and I work on proteins that can make fuel substitutes. Um, so I work on components of LPG, which is a gaseous fuel. Um, so day to day, I do um, basically protein engineering to try and make the proteins work better so they make more of the fuel. I also engineer the bacteria that then um, are used kind of as a as an as the organism that will produce the fuel and um, I try to engineer their metabolism so that they're more efficient and better at this process. And I also work on the well, setting up the um, industrial sized fermentations that will then be used um, to produce this fuel, hopefully on an industrial scale. Um, but really, my job also involves a lot of data analysis and kind of looking through um, the literature to see what we can do and how we can apply different scientific methods to try and make this process that we work on more efficient. So, uh, yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Amelia. And next question is for Richard. You also work in a lab, but a lab big enough that you can have a house in there. And I believe through the research you can make it snow, um, which is it just sounds completely amazing. Tell us a bit about your work and the research you're doing. How is that going to affect our lives in the next five to ten years? Yeah, so we, a lot of us on the core from Manchester. So if you walk around, you will see buildings that look exactly the same as the energy house. And they are very inefficient, they're, they're very poor performing buildings, so they cost us a lot of money to heat and they also generate a lot of kind of things that are really bad for the, for the atmosphere, so CO2 being one of them, so which is obviously contributing to, to climate change. So our goal really is, is to help fix the old buildings. The, the, the new buildings we can build to different standards and we can make them better quite easily, but we have about a quarter of the buildings in the UK are similar to this type of building that you see on the screen. So our goal really is to make these uh, easy to improve, uh, effective, so, so people benefit from the improvement. So instead of just saving energy, they can be more comfortable inside, they can be more flexible, they can have better lighting, they can have better acoustics so that things sound better inside and things like this. So it's really about taking the old housing stock that we've got and making it more efficient uh, to, to help save the planet in essence so that's really what we're doing uh, but we do it in a very kind of controlled way so the more accurate that we do things 
then that hopefully will help people um, convince themselves that, that this is the right thing to do. And also it, it attracts money so people can then you know, get funded projects to go and insulate buildings just like this as well. So that's, that's, that's in a nutshell kind of what we do. And yeah, we can make it snow and it is very cool and now it does snow. Oh, amazing stuff. I'm going to have to pop down to the University of Salford and see that. It sounds amazing. Um, and the next question I've got for three people, Sarah, Hannah and Julian. And I can see in the Q&A uh, in the message box, quite a few people have actually asked this question. What are the top three skills and attributes would you say are the most important for having a job like yours? So uh, shall I jump in there first? So I think I think the three things for, for my sort of role is having a passion for what you're doing. And I think that probably resonates with, with everyone on our, on our panel today. Uh, passion for what you're doing is an absolute must. You, you spend more time uh, at work than you do with your family during the week. So why do something that you don't care about um, for, for definite? I think communication skills are also really important, both written and verbal as well, because you have to be really persuasive uh, with those around you to really you know, make, make your message heard and encourage people to to come on board with what you're trying to achieve so that's really important and also never being afraid to take on a challenge um, so for me I've been given some really exciting opportunities such as uh, working on the Olympic Games back in 2012 and I learned so much and I got to experience so many amazing things and meet a lots of people and they've all helped me uh, in the past eight years to build my career and and get me to, to this role today. Okay, I'll go next. Um, so a, a bit of a, a similar scenario for myself. So one excellent communication and influencing skills. Um, this is key to getting your point across well, making sure what you're saying is to the point so people can understand why you're asking for any potential changes to what they've designed. Also to influence others to change things within a project and be able to show them why and the importance of making the changes because this will then be up against the cost and programme and time pressures. So it's vital that you can influence others to come to understand your way of thinking and why you're asking for things to be changed or be different. Good organisation and time management. Um, the better you get time management, the better your self-discipline will be. Um, this will also help you be more successful at meeting goals in, in different aspects of your life. Um, it also allows you to assign specific time slots to activities per their importance um, and then assessing each of the responsibilities to make sure that um, you're being a good person in time management and um, making sure you prioritise because there will be items that will need to be done quick and fast versus ones that need to be a bit more involved. Um, a fundamental part of your time management is, is planning as well. Be efficient in planning your day, your meetings and how you accomplish things. Um, and as Sarah said, be a genuine interest, understanding and passionate about environmental issues and relevant legislation. This will help you because, as you say, you're going to be at work majority of the time, so you need to be doing something you enjoy. But it also provides your evidence when you're getting your point across and why you're asking for change. But it will also allow your passion to, sh to shine through, which can actually help to change people's viewpoints, because if they see how passionate you are about something, they're more inclined to take it seriously. Uh, and really, probably just from my perspective, echoing similar points to Hannah and Sarah. So there's some consistency there in, in what we think are the, the, the key skills for working in our sector in our particular roles. Um, for me, it is all about collaboration. It's about influencing. It's about working with people, whether that's partners, customers or, or other colleagues in your own business. Um, the climate emergency, sustainability are relatively new subjects that people need educating and influencing and, and, and leadership on. And that leads me into perhaps my second set of skills is, is a good understanding of, of general business. Um, how understanding of finances, understanding of people management, understanding of actually how to work and, and manage yourself and manage others. There are things that you can pick up and really start to think about and build a self-awareness of really who you are and actually and how you interact with other people is really key. And the third point is is, is just that it's it's the it's it's about the the policy. It's about understanding what the environmental policy is, the impact it's having, so that you actually understand the technical disciplines and actually you can talk to others about those things, and then help and influence and shift some of that policy and thinking with with people because that there's a big journey to go on for society and a big journey working with the businesses. And like me, you could be part of that in helping other people. 
Brilliant, guys. Thank you for that. And now it's it's the moment of moment of, it's moment of future. It's the time. <laughs> Uh, we're going to hand over to questions from the audience. And the first one we've got is from Victor Oyadeli, if I've said that correctly. And, and I'm going to target that question towards Julian and who should we go? It's Julian and Sarah. Do you send the recycling to factories when you want to make it into electricity? And he's from Julian and uh, Victor's from Manchester. Um, well, I'll, I'll certainly have a, a a look at that, that question and answering that. Um, there, there is a huge growing industry from uh, generating electricity from waste. Um, there, are, there are a number of initiatives that are happening across the country and a concept called industrial innovation zones where um, everybody's been as innovative as possible in actually how that waste is used to best effect to minimise going to any landfill, but also how it can, can be converted. Um, and where are some experiments looking at actually how you can generate hydrogen from um, from the the, uh, the biofuel aspects of that waste and actually how you can recycle some other aspects of waste to put it back into production uh, is certainly something that uh, we're in discussions with Manchester City Council about about how we can help them improve um, their, their, their volume of recycling further to what they already do at the moment. Great, and then to add on to that point as well is um, that's everything that we pick up from rubbish bins, uh, from what people bring in, in say black bags to the uh, to the recycling centres and that's what we'll use to put in and, and to generate electricity. Anything that can be recycled will definitely go off to be recycled. Brilliant and then the next question we've got is from Louise from Hop Hopwood Hall College um, in Middleton and I'm going to direct that question towards Richard and Amelia um, she's saying, could our students become actively involved in local sustainability projects and or research? And if so, what opportunities are available in the near future? OK, I, I'll, I'll make a start on this one. Um, so we, we already do similar kind of engagements with with colleges and schools. Um, so we encourage people to kind of come and visit the facility. And if we're not kind of deep in testing we can we can show people around otherwise you can get a view of it from the outside and we can have someone explain what we do for kind of half an hour talk to you about our research talk to you about the things that are going in the local environment in Manchester around retrofitting the buildings and things like that so yeah we we, we often do that I think my uh, contact details will be available uh, on, on the end of the uh, on the end of the call so yeah drop drop me a line we, we're more than happy to do that we've done it for about nine years now so, yeah, we, we if we don't tell people what we do, it's kind of no point doing it. So uh, and we also there is a lack of, of resource in terms of people to come and do the jobs that, that me and my colleagues do um, globally, really. So we'd always encourage people to kind of come and see what we do. If you think it's exciting, then we can tell you how, how to how to kind of follow the career paths that we do in research as well. So, yeah, happy to do that. Yeah, and um, when it comes to sustainability research, there's a lot of groups at the University of Manchester for sure that work on different aspects of sustainability, whether that's biofuels or sustainable buildings or um, different engineering projects to do with sustainability. And um, there's definitely opportunities for students to come in and gain experience in those areas. Um, depending on how much experience you have, you can just apply um, to come and visit a lab or um, there are many open days that you can attend. Um, so, um, yeah, th there are definitely opportunities in sustainability at definitely the University of Manchester. Thank you, guys. And the next question we've got is from Harry in Berry. In the future, what will be the most eco-friendly way to travel? And that is going towards Hannah. Yeah, so um, I'm obviously going to say trains because of the project that I'm working on at the moment. But um, there's definitely going to be alternative modes of transport, but also looking at, at cars and vehicles, we're moving down into more of the electric route. 
and um, so that's definitely going to be something that's going to need to be um, looked into um, and where we're going to be heading I think as, as a country. We've also got things such as the clean air zones. We've got one in London already. There's one that's going to be coming in within Birmingham, but it's also going to be looking at using more um, modes of public transport. So obviously HS2 is going to be um, a low carbon option, which is going to be taking people up and down the country eventually. So it's going to be looking at different ways and alternative ways than what we've got at the moment. And it's not necessarily going to be completely different modes of transport, but it's going to be looking at the transport that we do use and how we move that into being more sustainable and environmentally friendly and reducing the carbon impacts. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Hannah. And I'm really sorry, guys, but we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, thank you all for your questions and thank you to all of our panel members who've been a part of today's session. Um, you can find out more about, about me and the panel members. Uh, we're going to have a slide up here with all the links. Um, and you can read up our, our, all our profiles. Oh, there you go. Uh, so you can read up all our profiles on the GMAX website. So that's www gmax.co.uk slash news and it'll have all the information about apprenticeships and career service uh, career service in, in forms of sustainability as well uh, for further information about careers which will help solve our current crisis you can also visit stem ambassadors uh, and bbc bite size that's got some great resources uh, for activities and resources you can also see the great science share uh, GMAX and the STEM ambassador portal as well. If you want to find out a bit more about the Blair project and what we do with electric and hydrogen carts, you can go and visit www.theblairproject.org. And I just want to say again, guys, thank you very much. And we've got another Q&A session on the 16th of June. And um, so if you'd like to come and meet some different panel members and hear um, what other people are doing in the sustainability industry, please, please tune in for that. And for now, thank you and goodbye.